Building your own electric motorcycle is incredibly rewarding. Not only do you get that smooth, instantaneous torque every time you smack over the throttle, but when you ride a creation that is absolutely your own, it always puts a smile on your face. But if you're thinking about building your own and you haven't done so before, well, I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. And as you go through, you're going to have a lot more as you learn things that you didn't know that you didn't know. I have built two electric motorcycles. This is my second, a, a Kawasaki KLR250 converted to a 72 volt power system. It gets 65 miles on a charge and has a top speed of 75 miles an hour. And yes, it's a ton of fun off road. My other bike is a 120 volt Honda Sabre capable of 145 miles an hour and 135 miles on a charge. So how did I learn all this? Well, mostly from experience. There aren't too many novels on how to build your own electric motorcycle. So in this video, I'm going to sh share with you the 12 most important lessons I learned in building my two electric motorcycles. And hopefully it'll keep you from making any of the expensive and time consuming mistakes that I did myself. I'm Alex Grieve and this is Higher Voltage. Lesson number one you might already know. They take a lot of time. And I'm not talking about just the assembly and fabrication process. Now granted, almost every single component you put on the bike is going to be taken back off and bolted back on at least once. In my case, almost every single part on this came off three times before I got the bike completed. No, it's the other things about life. You know, life in general, work, kids, wife, job, whatever. That's going to take a lot of time, so don't get frustrated just because you haven't made very much progress in a month. This one here took me nine months to build, and my other bike took me 11. Don't get frustrated, keep at it, because when you're done, it is more than worth it. Lesson number two. The hardest part of building an electric motorcycle is figuring out what to buy. Let's face it, if you're any bit handy or have fabricated anything in your life, the fabrication of the motorcycle isn't going to be the hard part. The hard part is figuring out what parts you need. Despite the fact that we live in the information age, figuring out what parts you need that will fit your bike is actually going to be the hardest part for almost everybody. And that's not because the information isn't out there, it's just there's so much information that it's hard to sift through it all. Which brings me to lesson number three. The most important component of your vehicle are the batteries. Now, we have three battery technologies that we typically use, all of which are lithium based. Lithium ion, lithium polymer, and lithium iron phosphate. I use lithium iron phosphate because they give me a life of between 15 to 20 years, which is much longer than lithium ion and lithium polymer, whose life is somewhere between four to eight years. However, lithium iron phosphate is the heaviest battery, so it is the least energy dense. You will get more energy per unit weight out of a lithium ion or a lithium phosphate battery. There is another reason that I use lithium phosphate. Well, two reasons. One, I can discharge them really hard without hurting them. I can discharge these to 6C without any damage to the cells. Even though they're not rated for it, trust me, I've done it plenty of times. These batteries are amazing. That's what I love about lithium phosphate. It takes a lot of abuse. Another battery that will take a fair amount of abuse, but not quite as much as lithium phosphate, is lithium polymer. These are typically used in drone or model airplane applications because they're very energy dense and they can put out a lot of power. However, lithium ion is the most energy dense, but it also has the lowest discharge rating and it's also the easiest to damage. And the last thing about choosing a battery is safety. This is my basement and that's a lithium battery. If you've ever seen a lithium battery fire, well, you can, you can tell you right now, if this would go up, this house would be gone. There is no putting out a lithium fire of this class. However, lithium phosphate batteries don't combust. They don't have the spontaneous combustion problem that lithium polymer and lithium ion do. So for the sanctity of not burning down my house or my garage and well, not potentially having a bomb underneath me when I ride, I chose lithium phosphate batteries. Lesson number four, you will rebuy several parts. Some will be expensive, some won't. 
For example, this was the original rear gear I bought for this bike. And as you can see, I've got a different gear in the back. <laughs> Why is that? Well, I didn't realize that to couple to an electric motor, I needed an industrial gear. And a 420 gear isn't compatible with an industrial electric gear. But a 530 size was. So I had to buy a new chain, new front sprocket, and a new rear sprocket. But that's not the only mistake I made. I made the mistake of buying the wrong motor controller. And when I say wrong, this worked just fine, but I just really didn't like the throttle response of this controller. And so I ended up changing it out despite another $1,100 to do so. I mean, I've got a lot of time and money into this already. I wanted to build it the way I wanted it, and you will too. So hopefully your mistake won't be that expensive, but yeah, you're gonna rebuy several components no matter how good you are. Speaking of rebuying parts, lesson number five, it's going to cost you more than you think. Your initial parts list is only a partial list. Chances are you're going to need other parts and tools that you didn't think about. Add on to the fact that you're going to be replacing several parts because they're not compatible and the cost is going to go up. By how much? Well, depends on your research and who you talk to. But yeah, expect to rebuy several parts and the price to go up. Lesson number six is a little bit different. Get advice, but know the difference between good advice and bad advice. There's an old saying, he who builds to every man's advice shall have a crooked house. Well, he who builds to every man's advice shall have a motorcycle that doesn't work. Let's face it, there's a difference between good advice and bad advice. There are a lot of people on the internet who just want to hear themselves talk. They have no interest in your livelihood. Sometimes they're a fanboy of a certain component. Other times they're paid by a certain company to sell you something. Others are just ignorant. And some are experienced and want to genuinely help you. Those are the people you need to seek out. People who are genuinely interested in your success that have the experience and knowledge that you need to get further. So know the difference. It's very important and it will help you along the way. Lesson number seven. If you're not a machinist, seek out several different machine shops ahead of time for the parts you're going to need. Let's face it. If you're like me, you're decent at welding, but you're probably not the greatest machinist in the world. And well, making your own bike means custom parts. This I had made at Sprocket Specialist, but if I were better at AutoCAD, I could probably design this myself and have, say, Fabrication Concepts down the road from me make this sprocket. But I can't exactly have Sprocket Specialists make the mount for my motor, which I designed myself. And again, who I, who'd I go to? Fabrication Concepts. So you're going to get to know several different machine shops when you come up with your build. Also, it should go without saying, if you're going to weld to this, you should be a proficient welder because this is going to have to hold together. So if you're not very good at welding, find somebody who is. Lesson number eight, you're going to need some new tools. It doesn't matter how well stocked your garage is, this is an electric vehicle and it requires some different tools. For example, I didn't think that I was going to need a cable crimper. I thought that, well, a torch and some solder, the way you solder pipes, would work just fine for these cables. Well, after a few tries at that, I realized that, well, a crimper was really the way to go. Other things you might need are things like insulated wrenches and screwdrivers so you don't short out the electronics of your bike. Don't worry about it. The tools are the lowest cost part of building an electric vehicle. Lesson number nine. Analysis is the enemy of completing your bike. Many people will get into analysis paralysis where they're not sure what step to take next or what to do next. Best thing to do is to step back, maybe for a day, maybe sleep on it, and let it just process in the back of your brain. Your subconscious will do wonders for this. But sometimes you come back and you still don't know what to do. Well, at that point, guess and move on. If you're just sitting there analyzing, you are not building the bike. And these things already take a lot of time. So if you don't know, guess and try. If it doesn't work, what are you out? A couple hours? Don't worry about it. Just give it a try. You'll learn something. Lesson number 10. There's a lot more to it than you thought. You might be the best planner in the world, 
but if you've never built an electric vehicle, there's a lot more to it than you thought. And you're going to learn things along the way that, oh, I didn't know that I needed a 12 volt converter to convert my 72 volts down to 12 for my lights. You also might realize that Oh, wow, I didn't realize I needed a master fuse or a high voltage contactor. I thought a switch might work. You're going to learn a lot of lessons along the way. There's a lot of more to this than you initially think. However, most of those lessons are taught pretty easily and pretty painlessly. Lesson number 11, range anxiety is very real. Now, I'm not talking about will it make it to work and back. Well, if I know that work is 20 miles away, then I know 65 miles of range is plenty to make it to work and back. But there are other things that you'll be anxious about. Is it enough to go to the grocery store? Or should I ride it to work because maybe I'll have something to do after work and not have enough battery to make it? Or, hey, I want to go on a motorcycle ride with my friends. Am I going to have enough battery should the ride go longer than I expected? Those are very real problems. And the only real way to mitigate that is to take a small battery charger and extension cord and mount it to the back of the bike. That way you can plug it in and charge it up anywhere and you're not completely stranded. Many commercial buildings as well as gas stations have a 120 volt outlet outside that they'll let you plug into while you play on your phone for an hour or two. Yeah, it's not ideal and you'll want to take it very, very slow to go when going home to conserve your battery, but at least you'll make it. And lesson number 12, there is no such thing as too much torque. The most fun thing about an electric bike is that instantaneous torque when you hit the throttle. So lean more towards the torque side than the speed. Look, this is an internal combustion engine. It doesn't get buzzy or less efficient as it speeds up. In fact, an electric motor is pretty much the same efficiency no matter what speed you run it at. So lean a little towards torque. So if the max speed of your motor is 5,000 RPMs, then look for a gearing of maybe 4,200 RPMs for 70 miles an hour on the highway or so. And the reason you want to do that is because, again, the fun is just twisting that throttle and feeling that bike just take off. So, as you can see, my first gear was this big. Well, not only was my tooth pitch wrong, but it didn't fit my swing arm. Remember I told you about rebuying? Yeah, this bike was supposed to have an originally was supposed to have a top speed of 45 miles an hour, not 75. And that's so I could just twist the throttle and wheelie on command. So right now I'm dealing with a smaller sprocket, but you can bet your last dollar that I'm going to go ahead and modify that swing arm so I can stick a big old gear on it. So when I twist it, the front end's coming up in the air. So there you have it. 12 lessons you will learn when building an electric motorcycle. I'm Alex Grieve. And this is Higher Voltage.